presenting. So, multi-threading in C. Principles, techniques, and tools. Uh, so my name is Michael Lefeld, and uh, I'll be telling you a little bit about how to multi-thread in the C programming language. Um, in this talk you'll learn some of the theory behind multi-threading, its uses and its limits, uh, those are the principles. You'll learn how various multi-threading ideas are applied and which kind of uh, uh, constructs you can use to achieve goals. To uh, Well, let's say you have two threads and they work together to achieve some sort of goal. Uh, how do you do that, right? So those are techniques. And uh, lastly, perhaps most importantly, you will learn how to compile and debug your programs, which tends to get kind of a bad reputation. We have a lot of questions about how to get your program to compile, but I will show you it doesn't have to be hard. So I'll first explain uh, what multithreading even is and uh, what it's about. And then we will be faced with our first problem, hello world. Yes, quite monumental. Um, we'll also be seeing our first bug, and for that I'll be using the thread sanitizer to squash the bug. And I'm going to be talking a bit about race conditions, and we're going to be using so-called locks to solve them. But locks come with their own problems, such as deadlocks and resource starvation, which I'm going to be telling you all about. And lastly, uh, conditions, which you can kind of think of as events. And, uh, well, lastly, a little bit about atomics and the volatile keywords and uh, what they really mean. Because volatile gets a lot of misuse and uh, I think it's time that the misuse stops. So what is multithreading? Well, multithreading is just when you have some code and you are uh, running it from multiple threads. So usually when you have a program uh, there is one one thread of execution, right? You do one thing after another. But when you multi-thread, you're doing things at the same time. There's uh, two code paths or more, each for one thread. And a thread is just a lightweight process. And a process is just a running instance of a program. Now you hear a lot about concurrent and parallel and uh, they both mean at the same time. And uh, multiprocessing, well, that's kind of the same concept, but you replace a thread with a process. But it's really the same concept. So allow me to just grab a terminal and I will show you a little bit of an example. So we're going to be using the Linux task manager, HDOP. And I'll show you a bit about uh, multithreading. Oh, geez. The text is really big. So each green thing here is a thread, and each white thing here is a process. So, for instance, you have this program call, uh, called cron-d. It's just a program, it doesn't have any threads. But here you have a program called network manager, and it has two little children threads. Now if you look through my system, as I scroll along here, you'll see tons of threads. Almost every program uses at least threads uh, in some form or another. So threads are everywhere. And uh, yeah, I just thought it was kind of neat to show you guys. So why would you use multi-threading? Why do all these programs use threads? Well, um, first of all, you can model the real world using uh, multi-threading. So our world is asynchronous. Things happen at the same time and with no real defined order. It's kind of chaos out there. So what if you took that idea and put it into programming? you get multi-threading. So it allows you to model the real world. For instance, uh, you might want your program to wait for a certain event to happen. Or maybe you just want to do multiple things at once. And knowing about multi-threading is also important because it allows you to squeeze the maximum performance out of processors with multiple cores. Um, most processors these days are multi-core and uh, yeah, so if you don't multi-thread all of those cores, they just kind of go, uh, oops, they just kind of go to waste, which is a real shame. So here's a normal program. Uh, this is programming in series. Uh, let's say you have a function called compute, and uh, you have two numbers which you want to compute. So in the main function, there's first compute one, and then there's compute two, and uh, well, 
after that is done, the program is done, it exits. And here's what that same program would look like in parallel. So here you have the main program, it starts, and what it does is instead of a computation, it creates two threads, and each thread has one computation going. Take a bit of water. And uh, what's important here to note is the join threads uh, thingy. So the main program, the main process, uh, has to wait for the computations to finish, and that is uh, symbolized through joining. This is called uh, the fork join model of uh, concurrent programming. The reason why is if you have a little bit of imagination, you can kind of imagine a pitchfork, right? So main starts out as one long handle, and then at the point where it creates threads, it kind of turns into a pitchfork, and then after the threads are done, you join them back together. So that is the fork join model of multi uh, concurrent programming. So you would say that it is twice as fast, right? If you do two computations at once, instead of waiting for one to complete and then waiting for the other, uh, you're doing it at the same time. So it saves time. Well, Amdahl's law is here to ruin our day and give us nightmares because it's not always that simple. Not every program can be parallelized easily. So let's uh, look back at the previous slide here. What we're doing here is we are creating threads and we are joining threads. We're, we're creating them and then waiting for them to finish. And those things are not parallel. We have to do that from the main uh, process. So the only thing here parallel is the actual computation itself. So the, the simple program which I just showed is not 100% parallel. Probably more like 95%. So if we here look at the pink curve here, I'm not sure if my mouse cursor is big enough, but the pink curve, uh, that's 95% uh, parallel. And you can see all the way at the top that you will only ever get a maximum speed up of 20 times faster. Which is kind of crazy because if you look at the, the x-axis, oh by the way it's kind of labeled wrong, I stole this graph from Wikipedia, um, it's supposed to say number of threads, but it doesn't really matter. Anyway, if you throw 65,000 threads at the problem, it'll only get 20 times faster. And most programs are not 95% parallelizable. Most programs are probably, well, even 50% would be a, a pretty great number. But if we look at the bottom left, we will see that if we have two processors or two threads, and uh, then we can expect a about a two times speed up, right? And if we have four computations, which we would run in parallel, we wouldn't get a four times speed up. We'd get a little bit less, about 3.8. And that's kind of how it scales. So those are the limits of uh, multithreading. And this is, this is a mathematical thing. You can't really escape it. Right. Uh, so let's jump into our first example here. Um, we're going to be using the pthread library, which stands for POSIX thread, and POSIX is a uh, an operating system standard, and uh, so it's it's widely available. And we're going to be using the pthread option here in our compiler to compile it. And I'll even introduce a subtle bug, and we'll debug it using a thread sanitizer. So uh, we are going to create a document demo one dot c. And, well, first of all, we start off with increasing the font size. There we go. I'm not sure if this is readable. I think this is big enough. Um, we start with including standard io.h because we are going to print hello world. Secondly, we're going to be including pthread.h because we're going to be using threads. Then we get our main function as usual. And you would say hello world except we're going to do this multi-threaded. <coughs> so if you think about it, main is kind of the entry point of our program. It's where our process starts. Likewise, a thread also needs an entry point. So let's call it a uh, thread fun. And in pthreads, a thread entry point has to return a void pointer and it has to take in a void pointer argument. Now we're not going to be using that argument so I'm going to cast it to void so that my editor doesn't yell at me. 
and we're gonna say hello world from the thread and then we're just gonna return null the null pointer because I don't really have anything interesting to return alright and then it's time for a function called pthread uh, create which will create a thread and the first argument that it expects is a little handle in which we will uh, in which it will store some information that it needs to handle our thread and it is stored in a pthread type so let's call it thread we don't really need to initialize it and we'll pass in a pointer to our thread and the second argument it expects is a bunch of attributes you can give your thread attributes and that will change its behavior slightly but that's out of the scope for this talk I'm not really interested in that so I'll, I'll pass in null and then it expects the actual function that we want to run so I'll pass in thread fun and uh, lastly the argument here can be passed in from here but I don't really have anything to pass into it so I'll just pass in null alright and then we are going to open a terminal and we're going to increase the font size again hold on well alright that works I guess um, let's see what kind of files do we have, we have demo1.c don't forget to save your file we're gonna do gcc pthread demo1.c and we're gonna tell it to call the executable uh, demo1 alright and now you can see that a little program has occurred called demo1 and we're just gonna run it and it says hello world three times well that's kinda weird isn't it because uh, well I only called hello world once so what happens here is a little mistake I made we have to actually join our thread and um, it also expects you to handle the return type but I'm not returning anything so I'm just gonna uh, pass in null again and we're gonna remove the hello world from our main function and now I think you will all agree that we expect a single hello world to happen and it works a single hello world and no more weird extra hello world bugs um, what happens what can happen if you don't join your thread is sometimes what happens is there's no output right which is kinda of weird because we are clearly creating our thread but it's not really printing anything out which is kinda of weird but it's not actually weird if you think about what's happening our main function here is starting up it makes a, a little thread container it then calls this function and then it immediately exits and our thread here never really has uh, the chance to run and properly say hello world and therefore you get no output so we can debug that by adding in some debug information with the G switch and we'll do F sanitize oops if I can type F sanitize equals thread and then we run demo 1 thread sanitizer will say that we have a thread leak in other words we forgot to join we forgot to wait for our thread the thread is still ongoing and we already exited and the first thing it mentions is kinda useless to us it's some sort of internal function but this one is quite useful it says which file is affected and if we look here at line 13 yes indeed that is where we create our thread and so pre-thread is telling you hey at this line you create a thread but you never join it so then if we solve the bug and we compile it again nothing happens and we just get our normal hello world and thread sanitizer shuts up because thread sanitizer is happy uh, let's see if we got any questions in the chat is this recorded yeah there will be a, a recording posted after the talk somebody asks so some th uh, pthread functions take pthread t as a pointer and others take it as value yes that's right um, this is called a uh, 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 an, uh, what do you call it an output parameter so because C only has a single return type uh, you have to pass in the object that you want to modify so pthread create 
takes a pointer to thread because it modifies this variable itself and therefore it needs a pointer. And actually pthread create has a return value which I'm completely ignoring and uh, you can test for it and uh, if it's not um, if it returns anything non-zero that means an error has occurred when creating the thread and you can use the uh, uh, you can use this function p error to print out what exactly has gone wrong all right so I'm gonna move back to the presentation here too many open windows oh actually <laughs> there's not much point to creating a single thread right so let's have some fun let's make this an array of eight threads and let's wrap our creation in a for loop we're gonna lift that in there delete that and uh, since we are now accessing a an array of threads we also have to do that correctly and we also have to join an array of threads so why is it not auto completing here we go I'm gonna join there we go join thread number I and uh, let's see we don't need threads and size for this and what you'll now see is eight hello worlds so eight hello worlds is because we are joining we are creating eight threads and they all say hello world and then we wait for each thread to finish and then we return uh, whoops. So here's a little diagram of what just happened. Main starts, we have our creates, and then you have eight hellos. And keep in mind, all this time, the main function is still running. And then you join your threads, you wait for all of them to finish, and then you exit. Can I explain Intel SMP? Uh, oh man, SMP. So that's a different kind of thread. So some processors will advertise that they have hyper-threading or something like that. Uh, there's a difference between OS threads and what I just showed you is an OS thread but CPUs also have threads. Um, a CPU has cores and each core usually has two threads and uh, they're different things and a thread on a CPU is basically a little a mini core which shares some common components and a thread on the OS is basically like a lightweight uh, running program so that's the difference and I am talking about OS threads. So let's talk a bit about race conditions. Two threads are racing to read or write a value and this has possible control flow implications. For instance if you have some sort of uh, some thread which is modifying a variable and some other thread which is reading that variable well it depends on the order right? If uh, the write happens before the read then you might get a different result in the if statement. It might take a different path. So I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to make a new file. I'm going to call it demo2.c. And I'm going to copy and paste most of this code. Here we go. We're going to make a global variable here. We're going to say, uh, I don't know, int var equals zero. And in our thread function, I'll do uh, var equals 10. And in our main function, I'll remove the loop. There's no need for that remove this loop and that one and make this a single thread again so uh, let's see and then I want to test the variable so if it is bigger than 5 then we'll say uh, bigger and if it's not bigger than 5 we'll say smaller so what do you expect to happen here right we are making our thread and uh, what happens is we set the variable to 10 so we create the thread it sets the variable to 10 and then we test it right and 10 is always greater than 5 so we should see bigger well let's see if that's actually the case gcp thread demo2.c slash o demo2 and we'll run that program and it's a smaller so that's kind of weird what gives well, this is called a race condition 
basically what's happening here is our main process is racing to read the variable and our side thread here is racing to write to the variable and one way we can solve this is by joining our th uh, thread so what happens here is we create our thread it sets variable to 10 and we wait for that thread to finish and only after it has finished we finally test the variable so let's see if that works and now it prints out the correct thing so just for completeness I'm going to reintroduce the bug and I'm going to compile it with uh, thread sanitizer and we're gonna run it again just to see what that looks like so here thread sanitizer has correctly identified the data race it calls it a data race uh, race condition data race it's kind of a synonym right it means the same thing and uh, what it says here is read of size 4 so the size is uh, an integer it's 4 bytes it's not really important here is the reading at line 18 and here is the writing at line 8 which checks out so thread sanitizer tells us okay hey you're doing something wrong here it's not telling us how to fix it we have to be creative enough to do that ourselves uh, so we can fix it again by waiting for the thread to finish first right all right back to the presentation uh, so in this case we solved it by serializing our program again we uh, waited we synchronized our thread to the main process and uh, we kind of forced a an order with that and another solution could be locks so if you think about a uh, well let's say you're going to school or to some sort of restaurant it likely has uh, some some restrooms and usually a toilet is accompanied by a stall which has a lock on it so think about why that lock is there it is there so only one person at a time has access to the toilet right you don't want two people uh, you don't want to sit down on the toilet and then suddenly somebody else barges in that's not really uh, well so in multi-threading you have locks for much the same reason and in this case our variable you could see it as the toilet so let's uh, solve this problem using locks so we'll do pthread mutex t now a mutex is kind of a weird word it's a it's an acronym it stands for mutual exclusion right so only one at a time and we'll call it uh, var lock and you need to give it an initializer here in all caps that's just kind of an oddity so in our thread fun uh, we will try to lock it and you have to pass in the pointer to var lock because it will modify some of the internal state of the lock itself and then uh, after you've locked it and you've done your business you can unlock it again right and so now instead of waiting to join it what we are going to do is we are going to acquire the lock first uh, pthread mutex lock for lock, there we go, and then uh, hold on. Actually, this won't work. This is not really a good example. Uh, here's a better example. Here's a more fun example, anyway. What I'm going to do instead is inside of this function, I'm going to comment this out for a bit, uh, and let's add ten thousand. To our variable here and let's create an array again so I'm just gonna copy that code real quick there we go so now we have eight threads and uh, they're all going to be adding ten times or I mean ten thousand to the variable here and what you would expect to see is 8 times 10,000 is 80,000, right? So you would expect to see, if I just print out the value of our var here, make it look nice. There you go. You would expect to see var equals 8,000, right? 
So let's see if it actually works. And it's not even close. Not even close. It is 35,000 and some weird number. So what the hell is going on here? Well, var++ actually consists of multiple steps. Right? So what happens in the register, in the, in the uh, CPU, what happens is first var is loaded into some CPU register and then the register is added together with one and then the register value is written back to the variable. So this is kind of what happens inside of the CPU. Now register is a deprecated keyword. It still exists but it doesn't really work anymore. Uh, yeah, see here it's already complaining to me. Oh, register int. There we go. And we get kind of the same wacky result, right? We get like 35. Here we get an even lower number. So what we need to do here is we need to lock the number and then we need to unlock it. We need to lock the stall. We need to do our business. And then once we are done, we can continue on our day. So let's see if it works now. And now we get the correct result because now this is not an issue, right? So why do you need to, wh why can only one lock at a time do this? Why can't multiple uh, threads, I mean, do this at once? Well, what happens for instance, let's say, uh, let's say var equals zero, right? And so thread uh, number one loads the number zero into a register. And at the same time, a second thread does exactly the same. So now there are two threads with uh, running on two cores, and both have the internal number zero. And they both add one, so both threads now contain the number one. And then both at the same time, they write the variable back. And so thread number one writes var equals one, and thread number two writes var equals one. And so they have both incremented but they're not, uh, you know, they're, they, they're not really aware that they are interfering with each other's business. And so that is why you need the lock. You need to force only one thread at a time access to do this. And you do that with a mutual exclusion lock. All right. So that was the uh, example I just gave. We used uh, locks and unlocks. And, uh, oh, I forgot to show what the thread sanitize output for that looks like. So let's remove the logs again. And just really quickly, go up, go up, go up. Right. And now thread sanitizer complains again about the date race. It says that we are uh, reading, we are writing here at line 12. Oops. Let's remove that. Let's compile it again, run it again. So we are reading at line 12. So we're reading it into a register. And then we are writing it back a few lines later. Uh, and uh, that's a data race, right? I just explained that two threads can do this at the same time. And they end up with the same internal register value. And they write back the same value at the same time. So. That's a counter. What's good to know here is uh, that a piece of code surrounded by a lock, like that for loop which I just showed you, that's called a critical section and only one thread at a time enters the critical section. Now some libraries have uh, dedicated functions for this, but in pthreads uh, I'm not actually sure, but I'm just doing it the manual way. Uh, and a thread save function, I guess I should mention those, a thread save function is when a function can safely be accessed from multiple threads. So let's say that uh, this is our thread right here and uh, we're calling some sort of function. Let's uh, do the pow function. Pow raises a number to a power. So let's raise a 2 to the fourth power. All right, and we'll do uh, float result equals 2 to the fourth. Well, this is a thread save function. You can run this from multiple threads no problems at all, right? But some functions require that uh, only one thread at a time... Uh, some functions require that only one thread at a time has access to it, right? Because maybe they are internally relying on something 
like a global variable. And so what happens in those cases is you need to, what I like to do is I like to wrap it. So let's suppose for a second that pow is thread unsafe. It isn't, but let's suppose it is. We'll do a float b and what we'll do here is we'll just call the normal pow function but we are going to lock it first so you'll have your p thread mutex lock your p thread mutex unlock and then you have safe pow lock uh, hold on p thread mutex t safe pow lock so this is what a thread safe function looks like if you have a thread unsafe function we'll store our result and then once we have unlocked the lock we will return our result it's important that you first unlock it and then return it so this is how you make a thread safe function now again pow is as far as I know perfectly thread safe but uh, it's just an example uh, you also have try lock and wait lock and well imagine going back to the uh, bathroom example imagine you are going to the bathroom and you see that the stall is locked right what do you do well usually there are multiple stalls so you go right to the next one but suppose there's only one bathroom stall what do you do well you'll probably wait a bit but if the person inside of the toilet is taking way too long you'll probably give up and just look elsewhere in the building for another toilet so that is what wait lock does wait lock allows you to specify a, a time and if it can't lock the lock within that time uh, it'll just move on and the way you use that correctly or smartly or whateverly is uh, let's use this function again so we are going to change this into a try lock yep or no a wait lock. Now let's do a try lock. A try lock is kind of like a wait lock except it has zero patience. It immediately gives up if uh, it is already locked. And what we will do here is we'll put this in an if statement. Uh, and we will say we did not acquire the lock. And if it succeeded we'll say we acquired the lock so this looks kind of weird right you would expect these two to be swapped but the thing is if it successfully locks the lock what happens is it returns zero so this condition will get triggered if it does not get the lock it will return non-zero and so this condition will get triggered and what we're going to do here is we're going to go back to one thread back to one thread and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, lock the uh, we're going to lock the lock before the thread has a function uh, the thread has a chance to lock so let's lock it and let's unlock it so would you agree with me here that since we are locking variable lock and thread function here tries to lock variable lock this will never work because it's already locked right it is locked before this function is even born this thread before this thread is born it is already locked it will never acquire the lock and we can remove that so let's compile that uh, oh, I'm using the pow function which requires math uh, let's just comment that out it's not really important and let's run demo 2 and thread sanitizer complaints <laughs> hold on uh, did I do everything correctly oh right I'm unlocking a lock here but it's not actually sure that I locked it right I only try to lock it but sometimes it fails to lock so we need to make sure that we only unlock it if we actually acquired it so now thread sanitizer should shut up uh, oh I forgot to rename it there we go and it will say we did not acquire the lock 
because we already acquired it here. Now if the main thread does not acquire the lock, then our side thread here will be free to acquire the lock for itself. So if we recompile it, this time it does acquire the lock. So that's how uh, try lock works, which can be really useful in some cases. Alright, deadlocks. This one is fun. So when you use uh, multiple locks, right now we've only used one lock, but sometimes you'll get a situation where you have two locks or three locks or maybe even more. And uh, what happens, what can happen is if there are two threads that kind of lock the same kind of resource and they kind of depend on the resource being unlocked, if you're not careful about the order in which you lock your locks, then you can get a deadlock. So here's a classic example. Here's a kidnapping, right? So a thief kidnaps a woman and the thief says, I'll let her go when I have my ransom money. Well, the husband, he's not dumb. So he'll say, okay, well, I'll pay ransom when I get her back. And this is a deadlock. Why? Well, because the thief depends on the husband giving money. But the husband giving money depends on the thief giving back the wife. And until either one of them steps forth and does it, it will never get resolved. So this is a classic example of a deadlock. Um, so I'll do a quick demo of this. And I don't feel like typing it out again. So I prepared a couple of examples here. So here's a deadlock, right? So we're going to uh, symbolize our woman with a lock. And our money is another mutex lock. And here's the husband thread. And the husband uh, has the money. But he wants to get the, the, the woman. And the thief has the woman. But the thief wants to get the money. So notice that these are in opposite order, right? Husband first locks the money and then the woman. And the thief first locks the woman and then the money. Now, I have wrapped this in an infinite loop so that uh, we get a better chance at seeing a deadlock. Because as I have written the code here, there can exist a deadlock, but it doesn't have to happen, right? There's a little bit of chance involved. So here we'll start the kidnapping simulation. We'll create a threat for the thief and, uh, well, actually, here's a serious bug. Those should be separate threads. And same here. So we'll start the thief, which locks the woman, and then the money. And we'll start the husband, which locks the woman, and then the money. So, uh, hold on. Let me just uh, get into the correct folder. Uh, demos. Alright. And we're going to compile our... A deadlock example and we're gonna call it deadlock and then we're gonna run deadlock all right you guys ready and so what happens is you see a whole bunch of thief has both resources and then it suddenly stops right this is an infinite loop so it's it's continuously printing and then it suddenly stops so what happens here well if we consult the code again you'll see here it's continuously, apparently, running this loop, which is probably because we started the thief first. And now the husband never really gets a chance to lock it because the thief locks it and then he unlocks it. And this happens so quickly that the husband just doesn't really get a turn. But when the husband finally does get a turn, you'll get a deadlock. You never see husband has both resources. Instead, you'll get a deadlock because um, the husband never progresses past this point. Why? Well, the thief already locks the woman, so husband cannot lock it. And thief cannot lock the money, because husband already has it. And so they get stuck, right? So let's see what this looks like uh, from the eyes of the threat sanitizer. And it should work. All right. So immediately here we get a bunch of colorful text here. And um, what it says is warning, lock order inversion, potential deadlock. It says potential deadlock because uh, as we saw, it doesn't have to happen immediately, right? Thief prints a whole bunch of times before the final deadlock happens. 
So that's why it's a potential deadlock. And eventually it does happen. So it throws some memory addresses at us. It's not really that interesting. Uh, here's what we're interested in. It says here's a mutex one and here's another mutex. And uh, in this file on line 26, so that's right here, we're locking or we're trying to lock money. And then in this file on this line, so that's line 13, we're trying to do the opposite, right? And uh, here it says 42. What is at line 42? Oh, here we are creating our functions. So thread sanitizer here gives us the lines where we create the threads responsible, but it also tells us the lines responsible for the uh, the, the wrong locking order. So how do you solve it? Well, I already have it here. The solution is an agreed upon lock and unlock order. So if we swap these two around and we swap this one around, now you'll see that both the husband and the thief lock the woman first, then the money, then unlock the money, then unlock the woman. One principle is that you have some sort of locking order. In this case, the order is woman, then money. And the unlocking order always has to be the opposite. right? And both thread functions, both threads, they are now in agreement. They, they agreed on a locking order. So let's save our file and we're going to quit our program and we're going to try it again. And now you can see that they're alternating, right? Every now and then the thief has a streak and every now and then the husband has a streak. What's interesting to note here is that they have streaks at all, right? Why does this happen? Well, there is some overhead in trying to lock a lock and whenever you don't get the lock it waits and sometimes it waits for too long and so let's say that thief is waiting for a woman to unlock right thief likes to run and he's waiting for the woman to unlock but the husband has already locked the woman and the husband unlocks the woman so then you'd say all right now the thief can swoop in well no actually because the thief is uh, waiting just a little bit longer right there is some uh, granularity involved here and the granularity is too large sometimes it's it it skips it doesn't uh, immediately get its turn so that's why you see these long alternations and this is only made worse by the fact that in fact the only thing we're doing is locking and unlocking if we had some extra computations going on in these threads uh, you would see the effect less pronounced so that's the demo of a deadlock and usually a symptom of a deadlock is that your program gets stuck, right? It printed that the thief... Hold on, let me see if I can get that output back. Uh, oh man, that's really long. Let's see here. Right, so here it here's the, uh, the old output where we still had the deadlock issue. And it just printed and printed and printed the same thing over and over again. So when that happens and the program finally hangs and it, it gets stuck, no more progression, that's a symptom of a deadlock. And a deadlock requires two threads to depend on each other. In this case, the thief depends on an action of the husband, and the husband depends on an action of the thief. And one of them can complete, and therefore none of them can complete, and that is a deadlock. So the moral of the story is, they should have just agreed on an order. So let's look at uh, resource starvation. Now what's interesting here is that this already is kind of an example of resource starvation. Thief here, in this old example, is the only one that gets the resource and the husband never really runs. So the husband, as we say it, is starved of resources. Um, but there's a more uh, simple example. So let's say you have three threads running a while loop and there are two locks right and thread A uses lock 1 and thread B uses lock 2 but thread C uses both locks so make a prediction in your head um, if you wait five seconds you just let the program run if you wait five seconds how many times will C complete the loop how many times will A complete the loop how many times will B complete the loop right 
and the answers might shock you. Uh, so here I have programmed it. Um, we're using this function here for sleep. If you are on Windows, you are likely going to be using the uh, Windows API for it. And here we have our log1, and here we have our log2. And here we have three counters, and these just uh, count how many times thread A runs. So this is how many times thread A runs. This is how many times thread B runs. This is how many times thread C, etc. And here we have a little global variable, which is a bit dirty, uh, but oh well. And we're going to be using this variable to kind of synchronize our threads, to tell them, okay, you can stop running now, right? Because um, we only want to run this simulation for five seconds. Now, I added some extra locks here, uh, which don't really do anything. They're not really connected to anything, but they are to kind of even out the benchmark, right? So here in thread A, we are locking lock 1, and we are unlocking lock 1. And we have also lock 11, which is a private lock. Nobody else touches lock 11, uh, but I just added these so that every function is locking and unlocking two, fun uh, two locks. And here in thread B, we are locking lock 2, and we are unlocking lock 2. And in thread C, we are locking lock 1 and lock 2, and we're unlocking both of them again. And again, these 11 and these 22, th those are just, uh, you can ignore them pretty much. And here we have three thread handles. We are creating thread A, B, and C, storing them in them. Let's run this for, I guess 10 seconds is long enough too. And we're going to, after the 10 seconds elapsed, we are going to say running equals zero. Now, I have the variable running here surrounded by a lock. The reason I have that is to prevent a data race, right? Because our main process here is writing zero to the variable running, but the other, the, the threads here are reading the variable running. So you want that to be synchronized with a lock, otherwise you get a data race. And after that, we just join them, right? They have stopped their while loops, and they are ready to join. And then we kind of calculate the total amounts uh, that each thread gets to run. So let's scroll all the way back to the bottom here. OK. And this one called uh, starvation. And Let's compile it and let's. Uh, forgot to give the name. And let's run the program starve. And now we're going to wait 10 seconds. So, have you got your uh, predictions in yet? So, thread A, thread B, thread C. Which one is going to run most of the time? So, what might surprise you here is that thread B uh, runs about 70% of the time and thread A only runs about 7% of the time and thread C runs 21% of the time so why is that surprising? well if you're like me then uh, you would have expected thread C to run about a third of the time thread A about a third of the time and thread B about a third of the time except thread C uh, locks both resources so it has to wait a bit longer, right? It has to wait for two resources instead of just one to become available. So you would say that C uh, kind of runs maybe 20% of the time and thread A and B, they both run the other 80%. But as you can see here, that's not true at all. Thread B ends up running uh, by and far the largest amount of the time. So that's kind of weird. So let's see what happens in B. Well, nothing all that special, we're just uh, we're getting the lock 2 and in thread A we're getting the lock 1 but what's really interesting here is in thread C we are locking 1 and then we are locking 2 and then we are unlocking 2 so if you think about it this one is going to be done first lock number 2 will be uh, locked the least amount of time and lock number 1 will First, you have to wait to get lock number two, and while lock number two is locked, you wait for lock number two. So while lock number one is locked, you wait for lock number two. 
and what ends up happening is lock 1 stays locked for a really long time and thread A here uses lock 1 so what ends up happening is thread A never really gets a chance because lock 1 is always locked almost and so that is called thread starvation now you'll never literally starve a thread right it will never run uh, zero percent of the time if you run your your thingy for long enough it'll usually get a few runs in but it will give a suspiciously low number of runs so let's see what happens if we change this around let's say we now uh, get lock 2 in the spotlights here and I'm just gonna change the delay to 5 because I think you guys get the point let's see and in this case uh, the statistics are almost swapped right thread B is starved because thread B relies on lock number 2 and now lock number 2 is almost always locked it's it's the longest locked lock of them all so uh, this is not only an example of resource starvation but it's also an example of something that we call resource contention or lock contention uh, lock and resource uh, they are kind of used synonymously in most concurrency talks and articles and stuff like that um, and so contention means that we have three threads all fighting to get a lock right they all want to get a lock in and uh, that's called contention and uh, the lock number two in this case is very contended Right, so that was uh, starvation. And now we get on to my favorite part of multithreading, which is conditions. So conditions are a really handy way to model the real world, right? Um, so here I have a little bit of text on the, uh, on the slide. The example is to make pancakes. You wait until the pan is hot and then you add the batter. So waiting until something happens, uh, that is exactly what a condition variable is for and so a condition in the the, the context of multithreading kind of means a different thing from uh, a condition in the usual sense right usually you say oh you have an if condi uh, condition but in this case I really mean a multithreaded condition so I have a little demo prepared for that as well <coughs> I'm gonna take some water guys I'm not used to talking for this long. All right. So here we have our condition variable. So this is what pthread uses to kind of store some internal stuff, and uh, it requires an all capitals initializer. And in pthread, which is kind of manual, you have to manually lock your condition variable uh, because otherwise you get a race condition again and note the two conflicting usages of the word condition in that sentence yes it's kind of confusing uh, so imagine a kitchen right and uh, you have one guy who will only whose only job it is to uh, add batter to to frying pans right imagine in a kitchen a guy is standing there with a ladle in one hand and uh, uh, a container of batter in the other and his only job is when he's called he has to add batter to a uh, frying pan. So how we do that here is in the batter adder uh, function. This is going to be the thread that adds better. Uh, we lock the condition uh, lock and then we have this, uh, this special function here called pthread condition wait and it requires a pass by reference or I mean pass by address and then here we unlock it again and what this will do in effect is this will block until this condition is finally triggered right so the thread will just keep on waiting it will get stuck on this these three lines and only when the condition is signaled from another thread it will continue execution it will print apparently it's hot and then it'll take two seconds to add the uh, batter because it's quite a slow guy and then he finally returns so here we have the main process you can think of this as the chef and uh, the chef heats the pan which takes a while and then he yells the pan is hot and then he signals the condition right 
and to signal a condition you have to lock it and unlock it and uh, once he has signaled the condition he tells us that he has and he waits for the batter adder to uh, finish his job and once the batter is in the frying pan he'll cook it and uh, it takes two seconds and then the pancake is done so that's a really quick pancake and we're gonna do we're gonna compile that um, we'll call it uh, pancake and then let's run pancake so it's heating the pan and there you go so what happens here is uh, our main thread here yells the pan is hot and then signals the condition and then it prints signals the condition so that's that's what happens here and then this thread springs into action apparently the pan is hot right it waits two seconds and then control flow is resumed here because we are waiting for the thread to finish and we say cooking the batter and the pancake is done so that's a really simple uh, example usage of a condition variable and uh, condition variables are really useful uh, for instance well I guess in games you can use this a lot um, keyboard events input events that sort of thing uh, if you've ever programmed in JavaScript, you will have worked with events, and this is how it kind of works behind the scenes, I guess. Uh, another option to handle user input is in a loop. You know, you just you uh, you have an infinite loop, and every iteration you check whether some input key was pressed or not. But that's really inefficient, and a condition variable doesn't waste an infinite loop. It doesn't waste a processor core just spinning on a on a on an infinite loop. So those are conditions. Uh, oh yeah, and a, there is a danger for deadlock here. If there is a mutual dependency, for instance, one thread is signaling the other thread, and the other thread is signaling the one thread, and they're kind of in step lock like that. Then uh, what happens if if one thread kind of dies and it it doesn't really signal anymore, then the other thread will just wait forever and uh, there will be no more progression and that is called a deadlock alright now a little bit about atomic um, this talk is already pretty long and I don't wanna spend the whole night talking about this so I'm going to hand wave a bunch of stuff but atomic comes from the Greek uh, prefix a meaning not or un and the word tomo meaning cuttable so an atomic thing is something which cannot be divided anymore. It is the smallest imaginable unit, right? And nothing is guaranteed to be one action. Uh, we saw earlier in the counting example, we got a really weird number. Instead of, we had eight threads and they all incremented uh, 10,000, right? Uh, and instead of seeing 80,000, we got this really weird 35,000 number. And that's because the plus plus operation wasn't atomic. Now, A plus equals B, that's also not atomic. First you load A into a register, then you load B into a register. And then you sum the two, and then you write the result back into the memory of A. And we have already seen how that can cause a race condition. And atomics kind of help us. They let us pretend that certain operations are a single action, right? They are undividable, and the race condition cannot happen. Now, the kind of actions which are atomic, uh, it's kind of limited, right? Um, for instance, uh, hold on. Oh, right. So all compound assignments are atomic, right? So plus equals, times equals, minus equals, and uh, regular stores, uh, so a regular equals A equals 5 a plus equals 5 those are atomic and a load is also atomic so if you say B equals a and a is an atomic variable that will happen atomically and it the compiler will kind of insert a lock for you and it doesn't have to be a mutex uh, sometimes the instruction set kind of your your CPU the lowest level machine code has a way of dealing with atomics and the compiler knows that and it will prefer to use those lower level methods now there are three ways to declare a variable as atomic in C 
and uh, it's kind of ugly and uh, I don't really have an explanation for it but um, my advice is to pick one and stick with it I like to use the underscore capital A atomic and uh, using that as a, as a separate keyword but they're all the same thing so <laughs> we got in the chat some comments about shoe shooting yes you have a keen eye um, so here's an atomic example right here's that counter example again we we have a counter we have eight threads uh, I define num threads to be eight and we have eight threads and they all add 10,000 to the counter, right? They, they do this 10,000 times. So let's see what happens. And let's call it uh, count. And we'll run the program count. And we get the correct result. We don't get any weird uh, 35,000 sort of weirdness. Now what happens if we strip away the atomic key word? we get a weird number again. So Atomic is definitely helping us here. It allows us to kind of... Uh, remember in, uh, previously we had to manually do pthread mutex lock and pthread mutex unlock and all that. All that extra code, it's now gone. So Atomics are really useful for making shorter code. But <clears throat> there is one difference, right? Which is this code probably performs worse why? Well, we're doing this 10,000 times and we are, for 10,000 times, we are incrementing our counter. And at each increment, the CPU locks and then unlocks, right? That's what atomic means. And the whole problem with that is that we now have 10,000 locks and unlocks. Whereas if we just manually locked the loop, we would only have one unlock instead of 10,000, right? One lock and one unlock. Um, the obvious example here is to just forego all of this and do counter plus equals 10,000. Uh, is that 100,000? Yeah, here we go. That's also a valid solution, but uh, keep in mind sometimes uh, you can't always just swap out uh, a lock for an atomic variable. It, may, it might have a, a little bit of a performance uh, implication. All right, so now we go to the food shooting guy. Uh, oh, wait, actually first, I thought it would be interesting to kind of show you what the assembly looks like. So here is x86. If you are using an Intel processor or a, an AMD processor, you are running this instruction set most likely. And what happens here is above we have C code and below we have the uh, compiler generated assembly, right? And you can see that they are pretty much equal except our on the right hand side we are using an atomic variable and what happens is uh, x86 has this thing called a lock prefix right so instead of a pthread mutex lock we just have it right in the assembly right there so I thought that was kind of funny uh, I added a link here which contains just this code so you can play around with it after I uh, publish this material alright foot guns so here's a spin lock a spin lock is one way to implement uh, a lock, right? So we, we saw the pthread mutex thingy. It might be implemented like this. I don't know if it actually is, but it could be. And what we are doing here is we have some sort of variable i. And we are waiting for i to not be 1. And So once i equals 0, that means it's unlocked. And then we can lock it ourselves. Now i equals 0, that, uh, or I mean i equals 1, that comparison there, that is atomic. And later on we set it, we say i is equal to 1, and that is also atomic. But in between it's not atomic, right? What can happen here is that we have two threads which are both spin locking, and um, both of them enter the loop at the same time when i is unlocked. Both of them see i is unlocked and they're like, oh great, I'm gonna lock it for myself. And now we have two threads which have entered the lock. So what you really want to do here is wrap this entire function body in a normal pthread lock. Atomics don't really help you here. Now 
you can use the atomic instruction here, atomic flag test and set, which is often abbreviated as TAS or TAS. And what that does is, uh, I have it here on the right hand side, it sees, it, it, it tests if flag is equal to 1. Regardless of that result, it sets it to 1. And then it returns what flag used to be, right? It, it, it returns the previous result. And it does that as one single atomic operation, so no data races. And uh, well, here's a cor correct spin lock implementation using the atomic flag test and set. And note that in the while loop, if it was already locked, well, we just try it again. We just we keep looping. And once we exit the loop, right, it means that atomic flag test and set return zero. While zero, that's uh, it breaks, so it continues to flow beyond the while uh, loop. And apparently it was unlocked and we locked it and everything's great. Uh, another example, I mean another uh, such instruction which is often used is the compare and swap, which is CAS. And uh, it kind of does the same thing. Uh, now, I want to go back to this bug here. This is called the time of check to time of use bug, right? So there is a little bit of time in between where we check if the lock is locked and where we set the lock to locked, right? We check it, there's a bit of time, and then we use it. So this is a time of check to time of use. This is also called the ABA problem, um, which is kind of similar. Here the spin lock is thread A, uh, thread A checks whether i is equal to 1 and then maybe some nefarious thread b swoops in and takes the lock and then thread a continues again and it sets it to 1 right so there's a there two threads are kind of uh, scheduled throughout each other and that is uh, it's called time of check uh, to time of use or the aba problem uh, as far as i know those are completely synonymous all right, we are nearing the end of the talk, and I promised a little bit of a rant about the volatile keyword. Volatile was originally meant for memory mapped input output. So you have some sort of memory address, and uh, whatever is at, at that address can change. Uh, for instance, uh, from some sort of input event or maybe you're using it to output. And this happens a lot on uh, embedded devices, for instance, right? You have uh, your memory address and maybe you have some sort of LCD module set up somewhere. And if you write to, uh, I don't know, address number 20, then you're writing to the LCD's memory, right? So that's what volatile is for. So it's meant for things like memory mapped IO. And there are a couple of guarantees that volatile brings with it. But they are kind of um, they are orthogonal to multi-threading, right? You can use multi-threading and volatile. You can combine them, but you don't have to. And if you are multi-threading and you want an atomic variable, you just have to say atomic. You can't call it a, a volatile. Sometimes you see code which seems to treat the volatile as some sort of Atomic replacement? It's not. It's absolutely not. Um, and volatile is also used a lot in micro benchmarks, uh, but that's also problematic because again, you're, it's it's kind of orthogonal, uh, orthogonal, right? It doesn't really have anything to do with micro benchmarking. It has to do with memory mapped I/O, and uh, well, so that's my advice for you: don't use volatile unless you are actually working with memory mapped I/O. Um, a little bit of an interesting note here is that the atomic flag test and set function requires a volatile atomic flag and that is because uh, I guess they wanted to allow for the flag to be memory mapped I guess I, I don't really know what they were thinking probably something like that um, but yeah so that's my uh, uh, little rant on volatile now there are some things which I didn't mention which are kind of essential to concurrent programming. Uh, semaphores are a really big one. Uh, barriers, thread pools, coroutines, blah 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 blah. 
I implore you to look this stuff up because it will help you become a better programmer but with the stuff that I mentioned in this talk you'll probably already be able to solve about 90% of the problems that you uh, might want to solve in a concurrent way and then for those who are extra interested I have compiled a little list of further reading um, and there's a little fun game about deadlock so fun game about deadlocks deadlock empire github.io which will kind of put you in the shoes of the scheduler and uh, you can uh, try to crash a program All right. So I think that I have to scroll back a bit. I might have missed some questions here. Um, if anybody has questions, I would like to hear them. And if you don't, I will wait until somebody comes forth. Why was somebody shooting his shoe? <laughs> Alright, so this picture, right? Somebody is shooting his shoe. Um, it's called a foot gun. A foot gun is kind of, uh, 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 I don't know, it's, it's a programmer meme when something looks like it should work but it's really easy to abuse it in a way that it behaves completely unexpectedly that's called a foot gun. And so I thought it would be funny to add a picture of a foot gun. Alright. Oh, somebody says here most do not optimize macros, like in QuickBench, are just volatile wrappers. I would say, what is your advice? Uh, what to use instead of micro benchmarks then? So, that's a good question. Um, first of all, volatile is like a little bit of TNT, but you can also go nuclear. Uh, let me find a folder here, programming bench.c, I think. Uh, let's see no I think this is the wrong one uh, because I do have a little trick here uh, one, th one trick that is often done is to create a little bit of inline assembly and to tell the compiler that that assembly can affect any memory and um, it's kind of like a stronger volatile I guess you could say um, let's see if I can find it real quick. Let's see here. Maybe it's right here. Nope, that's something else. Uh, benchmark. I'm just clicking anything that has the benchmark in the name. Nope, that's not it either. Uh, okay, now I'm getting kind of worried. I don't think it's in here. Let's see here. In C maybe. No, maybe in cursed. No, I have no idea. Um, hold on, actually, we are going to search every program for something that contains the assembly keyword. Ugh, I always get the argument order wrong. Uh, oh god, let's see. We got a huge word list here. Uh, none of this is really what I'm looking for. No, I think I deleted the file. Um, anyway, there's this C++ talk out there which is all about micro benchmarking. Um, I think if you look it up, C++ micro benchmarking talk, you will find it and that will contain all of the information you would ever want about micro benchmarking. But in general, I'm kind of against micro benchmarks because they are of limited use. Um, in a micro benchmark, you are stripping away all of the context from a program. And what tends to happen is the compiler can optimize a lot better with the context. And so the function that you are benchmarking ends up not really the function that you actually end up running if you compiled it normally in, in, in its normal circumstance. So that's why I don't really like micro benchmarks. Um, though sometimes they can be useful. All right, any more questions here? Uh, can you cast to atomic to do a single operation atomically? Uh, hmm. I don't know. I can't really answer that um, with confidence. I would say no, probably not. It's probably best to just start out with an atomic variable. 
All right, somebody here says this line of code is the clobber. Let me just copy that. Uh, oops. Right. This is just completely insane syntax, and uh, it tells you, it tells the compiler, all right, here's a little piece of unknown assembly. It affects all memory. Uh, let's see here. For your information, volatile just makes reads and writes side effects. Uh, for everyone who isn't familiar with it. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, volatile, uh, right, a side effect, an unknowable external effect. Another thing about volatile is that a value is never cached. If you have some sort of, uh, let's say you have volatile int pointer p, and p points to a volatile int, then every time we do a, equals p, it will reload this value. It will never cache the value of p. So that's also something that Volatile does, uh, which you may or may not want in your micro benchmark. Uh, oh yeah, counting nanoseconds, micro benchmarking C++. Yeah, exactly, that seems like the right one I meant. Uh, Somebody here says, switching between atomic and non-atomic on a single memory location requires ensuring you have no cross-thread borrows. I agree. Alright, so did I miss any questions? I'm gonna wait for, a, uh, I guess, a minute or two in case people are still talking or are typing out their questions. I don't really think that there are any more questions uh, in the queue. Oh right, somebody asks how to get the available cores for my process. Uh, that's a good question. I don't really know. <laughs> this is, um, it tends to be, uh, I know that pthread doesn't have something built in for it. It is really operating system platform specific. You really need to uh, look that one up on, uh, on a site like Stack Overflow or something. Oh, how to get the available threads for my process. Um, oh wait, you mean like a list of all of the running threads? I suppose you just have to kind of keep track of them yourself in the in C. Oh, and there's also some activity in the Discord chat. Oh, but no questions. All right. Somebody says, "For your information, warning," and then nothing. Well, that's kind of ominous. Oh, right, so you can have more threads than there are CPU cores and the operating system will just kind of figure it out and it will uh, kind of, uh, you know, it will schedule them. So if there are more threads than there are cores available, the operating system takes care of it and it will just run fine. It'll run slow, but it'll be fine. Alright, somebody here says, fork returns negative one on failure, and kill negative one kills all processes on your machine. Uh, all of the ones which it can kill. Right, that makes sense. Well, uh, since we don't really seem to be getting any more questions... Uh, Oh, somebody here says, you generally should use the same amount of threads as cores. Um, right. What I usually do is I 
have one extra thread because sometimes um, the thread will just end up waiting, kind of deactive, right? And if you use uh, one more core, you tend to get a little bit better throughput, but this really depends on your individual program. You have to kind of benchmark it, I guess. Uh, if you are doing really uh, I.O. heavy work, like every thread is reading and writing from a file, um, that probably won't be really nice because the operating system will just funnel all of it to your hard drive, which uh, kind of defeats the purpose. And if you are using it to do networking, then you might actually uh, have a benefit if you use more threads than cores, because some of the threads will be waiting to receive. Somebody says, for example, right now I have 4,000 threads running on my system, but I only have six cores. How can the OS handle such a big difference in the numbers? Um, well, it really comes down to scheduling and uh, the operating system uses some sort of scheduling algorithm. The operating system knows how many threads there are, how many processes there are, and it tries to ensure that every thread and process gets a fair share of uh, CPU time. How exactly it does this, you would have to look at the source code, but if you look up scheduling algorithms, that'll probably get you, uh, that'll get you an end's way. Alright, well, um, I think that it is now time to end this talk. That was pretty fun. Good audience, lots of useful questions. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Oh, I'm gonna wait just a bit longer for this discussion to end. Kind of rude to interrupt. Alright guys, thank you for watching, um, yeah, this was pretty fun. <laughs>